Welcome back to Mad Props, another episode of Mad Props. I'm very excited today because, first of all, let me just say, the first reason I'm excited is we got a guest again for people that are just first time listening. I usually have guests on, but I've recently been doing a lot of uh, solo episodes and stuff like that. That's the first reason. Second reason is we have a show. Last week, um, I didn't have a show. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about it in this intro, but we didn't have a show last week. So we have a show this week. Third reason is because Julius Thomas the Third, Hamilton himself, formerly known as, is joining us on this episode. Uh, Julius Thomas is a big friend of the show. He's been on this uh, show once already. He's been sketching up before. We've worked together in different ways. Very excited to have Julius on. And Dimitri Milken is coming on, and they're going to talk about their show, uh, Good Guy with a Pun which um, I can't wait to get into. I can't wait for them to talk about. And I can't wait for all of this. I'm just really excited today. I'm having a good day. Played some basketball this morning, you know, all revved up. And we have a really good conversation, so I'm excited about that too. Before we get started, make sure you follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Mad Props Pod. Also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, slash X, LinkedIn, YouTube, all that stuff at Schnabel Studios. Make sure you like and subscribe this video if you're watching or like and subscribe to the podcast overall so you can hear every Mad Props as it comes out as we are really revving up and we're really going. We've had a lot of good stuff going on. So last week we didn't have an episode and I know people messaged me and said like, where was the episode? What are we doing? Well, there's two reasons. The first reason is I was moving um, I'm, I'm still in the same city, but we just kind of moved a little bit down the street and, uh, that was the first reason. But then as I was trying to get, you know, ready for an episode, um, we had some internet problems because we had a couple of tornadoes. Yes. Tornadoes, uh, come through, including one where we had a tornado warning that I'm about to bring you through. So I am from the Northeast as you, as y'all know, most of y'all know, at least I'm from New York. And we don't really have tornadoes up there. Like, tornadoes aren't really a thing in New York. They are, but I've never had a tornado warning in my, in my life. There's been some watches uh, that never occurred to anything other than dark clouds and a little bit of rain. Um, but, but this time, the, there was a tornado warning, like, yo, it's coming. And uh, so, so I was wo- we were woken up at, like, 5, 5.30 in the morning, um, told that the sirens are going off by Mary, my girlfriend Mary's mom's house. The sirens are going off and um, just be ready. They might go off by us. And then wouldn't, you know, the tornado sirens go off. So for people that don't know, tornadoes are like when I was a child, tornadoes were like a top three fear of mine, even though they didn't happen in New York. I just watched too many videos and read too much on them. I remember as a kid, I had a book. It was like a weather book. And I was infatuated with the tornado section. And I would sit there and just read it and read it and read it. <laughs> and just infatuated with how it went. I read about the levels. I read about the wind speeds, all that stuff. Like the damage it can cause. I, I just infatuated with it. And then and over time, like I would watch videos on different tornadoes and the damage they do and all that stuff. So now I'm sitting here in a tornado warning sirens going off hail the size of baseballs wind at like a hundred something miles an hour i think it's 100 miles an hour and we're going into the the closet to cover up because a tornado can happen at any minute and all those childhood fears i had boom right into the chest i was i was freaking out i was legitimately shaking i was terrified of it all mary was cool as a cucumber being from the area had no no cares in the world. She's like, yeah, it happens. This, this irons go off. What are you going to do? Um, but we had to be in there for a while. I think we were in there for like an hour and a half before the warning finally went away. Nothing ever touched ground, but the damage was crazy. Uh, we took the drone up. I have a production drone with me. We took the drone up and we looked at some of the, the damage. Our building, by the way, is a fortress apparently. No damage to the roof or the shingles or the wall or anything like that. But, um, I mean, all the houses around us and the trees and, and all, there was just a lot of damage all around us. And it, you definitely saw, even though nothing touched down, these things can, 
these things can be devastating, which was which was crazy to see. But anyway, without all that fear inducing stuff, let's go into Julius and Dimitri. Um, they're on here to talk about the uh, they're on here to talk about a good guy with a pun, which is their TV series they're pitching. Um, I got to see a screener of it. I'm telling you right now, it was really good. Um, but that's not what they're really pit- that's not really what they're going to promote. They're going to tell us about the story of going from idea to the collapse of the idea to the build back up to the teaming up to the production. Like all this, it, it, it didn't seem like this was going to happen. It uh, was kind of formulated in COVID, and then it all came together. And we're going to talk about not only how it went from the writing of it, but then the getting Julius on board and then getting the finances to back this thing and the, the people he that Dimitri had to meet to make it go to the next level and how they, they built this. I mean, you're going to hear in the interview that it went from an idea to crumbling upon us and looking like it's not going to work out to building it back up over the next couple of years. And now it's an actual made thing. And it's a really exciting story to hear because a lot of people out there that maybe, maybe you are someone that makes films or you want to make films and you think like, Oh, I'm never going to be able to do this because like I hit a roadblock, but just shows that roadblocks don't matter. Just keep going. Um, so that's what we're going to kind of talk about in this. The show itself is about a child star that is um, sharing his whole life on social media, on Instagram. And the cool thing about this is it's filmed in the way that it looks like you're watching um his story the entire time like you're watching it like you are in that world on your phone following this character and watching what's going on so you're watching all these events take place on his account in this world so he he's broadcasting his fame he's broadcasting his life to cling to his fame and then he stops a mass shooting which skyrockets his fame to a different level because he's now a hero in, in this city, in this town, and people want to work with him now. And it's a really good, it's, uh, I love the concept. I love the story behind it. I think it's really good, and it's got a lot to build from based on what we saw in the film itself. So I'm very excited for you guys to hear the story. I'm really excited you guys to be introduced if you um, have never heard of him before to Dimitri and to see Julius again um, and to hear these guys talk about this this film that they they took from the ground and built it up into something that has now won won awards and stuff like that. Make sure you follow them as well if you want to see more of that. You can follow Good Guy With A Pun on Instagram and you can see updates about the film itself and see where they are in their story, in their production, in their broadcasting of it as well. And you can follow us at Mad Props or at Chernobyl Studios as we'll share these. Uh, we'll share this stuff with with you guys. We'll share the um, you know uh, updates and announcements that they're going to give in our story as well. So whether you're with their audience or with our audience, or you're new to both audiences, there's ways to find it everywhere you go. So without further ado, let's get into it. Let's talk to Julius. Let's talk to Dimitri. This is Mad Props. <laughs> All right, Julius, welcome back. Dimitri, welcome to the podcast. It's great having you both here. How are you guys doing? How is your day going? What's going on? So uh, good. Thank so you so good much to be for back, my friend. Oh, I knew we were going to do that. I waited for you. I, was, I, I should have done that. I, <laughs> you know, the second I said what's going on, I should have been like, I should have gone one at a time here. Yeah, but good, I good. didn't do that. So, <laughs> yeah. So so uh, let's let's go Julius first because I said him first. And then, Dimitri, you can go second there. Yes, yeah, so we will save the best for last, Dimitri. Yo, what's up, my friend? It's so good to be back. Yeah, um, things are well and trucking right along. I'm excited to be back on the on the cast. Thank you so much for having us. Of course. And we were talking a little bit off air about it just a couple weeks ago, randomly in New York City. We just run into each other. I don't even live in New York anymore. I live in Dallas. Happened to be there for one single day in the city. And we run into each other on a random street in New York. 
bizarre. It was bizarre. Very bizarre. It was like meant to be too, because I never go down that street. It's like I'm never that far north. And for whatever reason, I was running across town trying to make a seven o'clock showtime, and I was, I just hear my name, and I'm like, no way. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that's. I said out loud. So we were with my girlfriend, my parents, and my friend Jesse, and I said out loud, I was like, no way, Julius, <laughs> just so loud. I was like, there's no way he's walking down the street right now. That's unbelievable, but it happened, and we have a nice little picture from it. True. Hey man, the universe brought you guys together, and now we're here. Yes, and now we're here, and now we're promoting your, your stuff. Dimitri, how's it going? How you doing? Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I'm, I'm good, man. I'm, you know, living the dad life. It's, I'm just constantly tired uh, with my toddler, but other, without, other than that, I'm great. <laughs> well, That's not other than that. <laughs> other, yeah, other than li- being a dad, than, you know, things are great. Dad, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that. No, yeah. no, no, that's that's awesome. And you guys are here because you're promoting your film, um, "Good Guy with a Pun," which it's it's exactly. really good. It's really innovative. It's really different. So, Dimitri, we'll start with you as the writer and director and everything. Where did this idea come from? How did it come together? And how did you get it made? All right. Well. Julius isn't going to get to talk a lot because that's a very good, very <laughs> long story. Um, uh, well, so how it came together. So I, I, I had this like big animated thing that I was putting together um, before the pandemic. Um, and it got really far from here to Tribeca, um, got to the right people. And it was uh, looking like it was going to be like this huge thing. Um, and then it, it right before the pandemic started, like it really fell apart and it was just at, at a really low. And I, I was like, am I going to keep going with this? Am I going to quit the industry? Like, I really thought this was it. Um, and I, uh, just got inspired by listening to some, some filmmakers talk on some podcast, uh, that basically like, don't take a yes or a no for an answer. Just use your, whatever resources you can, whatever limitations you have, and whatever community is around you and make something awesome, make something innovative, make something new. So I'm like, okay, so, so like, I just kind of like took an, uh, like assessed what I had available to me and what were the things standing in my way and how I can actually use those things to tell a fresh new narrative. And there was just so much like awful things that had happened in the world for, you know, a good stretch of time, you know, all the mass shootings, the pandemic. Um, everything in politics, like it was just so much stuff going on all at once. Um, and I, I wanted to tell a story that was very much like for our generation that everyone in our generation could connect to and sort of like talk about the collective trauma we all have. Um, and I noticed that every single one of us is both so obsessed with social media and technology and all these modern things, a way, uh, modern way of connecting to each other. Like, I mean, right now we're all three of us are talking on a little commuter screen. There's three little squares where we're all like having conversation and you're in Dallas, I'm in San Francisco area. He, Julius is in New York, right? So like all this is happening, which is so ubiquitous and, and we're used to this. Um, and at the same time, we're all completely obsessed with our youth, like all the time way before all this was existed, like our, you know, all the stuff from the Full House and Boy Meets World and DuckTales and all this stuff from when we were kids before all this crap happened, which in my mind really started with Columbine, right? So all this stuff is swirling in my head of how I'm going to uh, uh, do this. And uh, right before the pandemic, I had won the Hamilton lottery because I was in just the worst mood after my animated thing fell apart. Um, and I was just looking for something to pick me up. And, and so I went to Hamilton Lotto. My wife and I went, sat front row center, uh, saw Julius Thomas III come out on stage and just wowed the hell out of us. And like uh, towards the end during the um, this quiet uptown scene, um, my wife and I just burst out into, into tears at the same time. And so um, afterwards I was in this like weird daze of like, what the hell did I just see? Like, who is this person? Um, and we're all like, everyone's walking out of this, this theater, this matinee show and everyone's phones start going crazy and buzzing and alerting. And, uh, it turns out that that was when the pandemic started, when we were inside the theater, like the entire world had shut down. It was uh, March 11th, 2020. Um, and we saw the last theater performance, uh, for like two years in the entire country. 
Um, so then I just went home and I, you know, all this, like I saw this great performance and then the world is over basically. So I'm like, I just have to reach out to him and, and, and follow him and I'm just going to focus on that. So I did that. And just as I did that, he had posted a video on Instagram, um, that, uh, he's like, you know, I, he found out about it basically around the same time as we did. And so for him, that meant that he was out of a job and he didn't know what was next. And he, you know, moved to the Bay for this. And now what's next? I don't know. So, uh, he was just really low and I felt like I had, had been through this really low point. Um, I know what that's like. So I messaged him just to offer some positivity and just be like, listen, I'm really sorry about what this means to you. I was there. I watched your performance. Like, I, I think you're a star. I think, um, you're just such a sensational actor. You moved me and my wife so much. So I just wanted to thank you. I wanted to give some positivity, um, and would love to connect. So then a friendship formed. And when I came up with this idea, I had Julius in mind, but by that point, um, he was back with Hamilton and, and theater had picked up again and I'm like, he's not going to like leave Hamilton for this little project. Um, but then I wrote it in all, all, like in one draft all night, stayed up. And then the next morning I see again on Instagram, Julius posts another video saying, well, it's, uh, my last performance on Hamilton. I have no idea what's next. Just, you know, fate, man, what can I say? So I, I immediately messaged him, like, I, I, last night I wrote you a project. Like, can you please read it? Can you um, consider coming on board? And then after he read it and liked it, I was like, look, I want to do this with you. I want to have you be in it, but I don't want you to just act in it and have you be like a gig for you. Like, if we're going to do this, I want you to be my partner. We co-own it 50-50. We, we bring it like to life together and we ride this train together and see where it goes. And that's what happened. And Julius, how'd that feel like knowing that your performance there was so, so inspiring to him that he created a project specifically for you to be in? Like, it wasn't just like, hey, I have this project, you want to be a part of it? It's like, no, this was made with you in mind. Yeah, it's crazy because like, if you roll back the tapes, probably at some point in one of the times that you can't, that we talked, you, you might have asked me like, like, what's next or what do I want to do next? And the thing that I've always been saying to people most recently is that I want to do something that is created specifically for me. I wanted to do something like, yeah, I could say I want to play this role that's already out there. I want to be in this show that's already. But on my heart really was like, I want to do something that is for me, was written with me in mind that I can shine in. And that was the thing that I was sort of like, those were my prayers. Those were the things that I was putting out into the universe. So I was both... Um, I couldn't tell him this, but I was both like ecstatic about the idea of somebody creating, creating something for me, but I also had to keep it close to the chest because I didn't know whether or not this person was crazy. So <laughs> you have to, you know, sort of like gird, gird it up, gird your excitement with a little bit of um, a little bit of, a, of guardedness. So that that's that's how I responded. But but inside I was like, this is exactly what I've been asking for. This is exactly what this next year for me, this next phase of life. I wanted it to be. So Julius, before he reached out, were you kind of lost in what you're going to do next? Or did you have some projects you were thinking of and then put them to the side for this? Like what was your next move before you actually got to this and, and then you get this gig? My next move. So my next move was first of all, break was like, I want to take some time to not, <laughs> you know, be out in the world giving. I just want to like sit on my couch, go reconnect with my people um, go uh, hang out with my family, come back to New York, be with my family here. And, um, and so that was like the biggest thing. But also I wanted to make a switch. Like I, I had been hard in theater. You know, I've been very fortunate. For tw almost 20 years, I went without having more than two months off from a theater gig. You know, I've never had like a, a, a survival job or any of those things that um, actors are typically um, typically have to do to sustain themselves. I've worked in theater for almost 20 years since I graduated from college. And so I was like a little winded. So I said, I want to take some time. I want to do some TV and film. I want to be more of a human. I want to reconnect with people. I want to sit still. And theater is, um, I just want to put it to the side for a little bit. So that's the, the, you know, those are sort of the things that were on my mind. So this sort of fit perfectly. And, and it was also an opportunity for me to, to work on a new skill because I feel very confident on stage, but to work on a new skill uh, in, in, a, in a place that felt safe and didn't feel like going on to the set of Modern Family with these like, you know, crazy, incredible people who are stars. You know, I could sort of like learn a little bit as I went. 
So, Dimitri, Julius, you send it to him. He's on board. What happens yeah. next? Like, what, what is the next step for you? How do you get this thing now from an idea to you have your actor on board to made and ready to be sent out to film festivals? Ooh, that was that that's like a year and a half journey. I mean, honestly, like, well, OK, now I have a Broadway star attached um, <laughs> and he's trusting me to put this thing together. And it's a, a new world for him. And I have to pull this thing off. So now I'm like, OK, I probably need some money for this. <laughs> um, and uh, so I had to raise some money and like it, it was not a very uh, big budget. It was um, way less than you would think. Very shoestring. And I, I mean, so one of the things about I mean, we haven't even mentioned yet is that the entire narrative is shot and told as if it is a stream of um, Instagram stories. So it's all uh, vertical. It's 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 you know all made to look like it's on a phone, which is great for the narrative, but also really great on the budget, right? Um, so it, but it also is very, very untraditional. So it took some convincing of, of, of people to, again, trust me that this thing is going to work, that people are going to accept it, that, that the audience, um, is ready for it because they've, they've lived it for so long. So my next step, I mean, I had to ask some very nice, kind people that believe in me to help fund it. Um, I had to call in every single favor I've ever, uh, acquired, um, from people to give me like way less of their day rate than, than they, um, normally get, or, um, even sometimes volunteer. Uh, so it's, it was one of those things where like, I'm, I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but it's one of those things where in, and there's a lot of moments with this project, like when I met Julius, um, and, and like when I met my cinematographer, um, like a lot of, these moments that came together in such an unexpected sort of serendipitous way that you have to kind of in that moment pause and you're like, huh, another one. I think this is the right track. And so one of the, one of the things that really came together with it is that um, I met a, a wonderful man named Michael Pritchard, who um, is a, a local legend here in the Bay. Um, he uh, grew up his entire life being um, very close friends with Robin Williams and they went into a comedy together. Um, and so I met him because I, when I was getting into photography, took a photo of the Robin Williams tunnel, realized that the, the spacing of it was very, very close to the actual spacing of um, Robin's eyes. And so I, I composited this photo together that, that was Robin's um, face from the po uh, poster for toys and uh, the, the photo I took of the tunnel. And then like two days later, ran into a wonderful woman who used to be Robin Williams' neighbor. And so I showed her the photo and, uh, I just was helping her with some photography. I didn't want to charge her and like, look, just hang out for five minutes, talk to me and I'll do this for you. Um, and so while I was doing that, I found out she's, her, uh, his former neighbor and she's like, Oh, you know, we'd love this photo that I showed her is his wife, Susan. So now I'm meeting Robin Williams wife. And so I, I framed the photo. I give it to her, um, connect with her for, for a little bit. And then she's like, you know, who you need to meet is Michael Pritchard, who's, um, his lifelong best friend. And so then I connect with Michael and Michael is the sweetest, kindest person you ever meet. He has mentored giants and legends like I believe Gavin Newsom, Tom Brady, like he, he knows everybody, but in a, in a, in a way that is very humble. Um, and just, he just, it, his entire life is to be of service and help. So he met me and he saw what I'm trying to do. And he's like, you know what, you're trying to make a, a project that is full of positivity that talks about real world issues, but in through optimism, not pessimism. It's like, I believe in this project and what you're trying to do. Let me try to get the entire community to like help you do it. So he just, he rallied the troops and I got all these businesses and organizations, all these people in, in my area in, in, in the North Bay and Marin, um, to just come on board, volunteer their time. Um, local TV studio helped us like use some space and equipment and help us with some tech stuff. Um, we filmed the mass shooting scene at the, our local grocery store that just let us have the entire grocery store all night for free. And we're like, you know, we're staging like a, a mass shooting here, right? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, we're going to have to make this place look like it was shot up. And like, okay. I'm like, okay, we'll clean up after. Like, don't worry about it. We got it. Um, so we had like, you know, this like gourmet donuts <laughs> company here, like give us 
boxes and boxes of donuts every single day so that the cast and crew would be happy. Um, so just, it's just all these things aligned. And so Pritchard would tell me that. So he, one of his buddies um, from, from way back was um, uh, George Lucas. And he was around when George Lucas filmed American Graffiti here in San Rafael in the same town. Um, and he was like, you know, there's something about this project that just reminds me of that. Because when George was trying to get American Graffiti together, everything aligned. All these things that before hadn't are now coming together. And, and he made that movie in like just a few days. Um, so it's, it's one of those things. I don't know exactly how to explain it, but here we are. Yeah. And is that kind of, so there was a lot of big moments in the making of this film, but meeting Michael Pritchard and then him saying, let's get the troops together. Is that when you really felt like, oh, this thing's going to happen? Like this is, we're going to have the materials we need. We're going to have the things we need to actually do this. You had the star on board, you had the idea yeah. on, on, and now this is the finance and everything else you're going to need is here. Is that when you really hit like, oh, this is happening? I think... I'm an optimist, but I'm a, I think I'm a wounded optimist. And so a, a wounded optimist uh, never fully allows himself to get quite there the way you're describing it. Because like I've been there before with other, other things. And, I, it, and thinking, oh, it's actually going to happen and like committing to that, it's a bit of a dangerous thing for like someone that kind of has their heart on their sleeve. Um, so I, there were all these like, I'm like, okay, that's a good sign. Okay. Oh, that, now that came together. Okay. Let's, let's wait for the other shoe to drop. And it was just kind of like an ongoing little step-by-step -step thing of like, oh, this is coming together. Oh, okay. So I got the money now. And it's like, oh, I got like a producer to come on and like, like create, um, like, uh, payroll and, and insurance and all these things that I don't know how to do. Um, and oh, I got Margaret Cho to be in it. Like, all these, like, little things. I'm like, I think that's a good sign. Like, all, little, little, I'm like, I think I can allow myself just a tad more hope. And like, oh, we got a premiere at Series Fest. Oh, okay. And then I'm just, I remember sitting at Series Fest next to Julius at the award show. And I think I got made, like, a fool of myself, like, 15 minutes before that. And I'm just like, all oh, these things are going wrong today. I'm like, I'm just not going to win. Like, it's not going to work. And I'm just sitting there being like, all right, look, hey, you know, made this great film all this experience, like, oh, come here. that's good, I'm, I'm good. And I'm just, like, sitting there deciding that I'm going to lose. And then I just took a pause, and I'm like, you know what? All things are equal right now. Like, uh, we, I, we don't know. It's Schrodinger's cat, right? So I'm just going to choose to win. And, like, a minute later, they called my name for winning, and I'm like, oh, my God, now I have to give an acceptance speech. And I just realized that in that moment, I'm like, hey, maybe this thing is actually going to work. I think that's the moment that I had it. <laughs> Um, but before that, it's, you really, it's really dangerous to kind of hope and, and, and think that it's going to come together. And you won for uh, best writer in a, best digital, writer. Digital. In a yeah. digital short series. So for maybe people that don't know what series fest is, can you tell them a little bit about like what this competition is held out in Colorado? Yeah. So, uh, series fest, it's in uh, Denver, Colorado. It's their it's 10th year. Um, an incredible festival that, um, it's, it's basically like the Sundance for television. Um, it, it celebrates episodic content, um, uh, really is the first of its kind exclusively. So like other festivals have caught wind of, of this. And so now Sundance has episodic, um, Tribeca has episodic, South by Southwest has episodic, but, but Sirius Fest is really like the premier festival for this. Um, and the industry comes out to, to, to actually go there and to, to engage with the, <clears throat> to the filmmakers, um, where in other festivals, that's not always the case. Um, it's, I mean, it's really just kind of a godsend to, um, people that not only are, are working as professionals making, um, episodic content to that scale, but uh, they, they include digital series. Um, they even have pitch -a -thons for people that, are literally just wrote down an idea and have practiced the pitch over and over again, and they give them an opportunity. They work with um, uh, Shonda Land, Shonda Rhimes, Betsy Beers, um, and create opportunities and in, in internships um, uh, for um, young professionals that are, are, are getting into that game um, and give them an opportunity that they would never have had otherwise. Um, and they just uplift voices. Like, it's, it's, it's really... Every, I, I could not speak higher about that festival, the people that um, created it, 
Um, and it was Julius's first festival that he's ever been to, film festival. Yeah. And I kept telling him over and over again, I'm like, this is not the norm, dude. Like, you are spoiled right now. Don't get used to this kind of treatment and this <laughs> sort of exposure, this type of, um, like, upscale quality. Um, it, was, it was quite the experience. So what was your experience, Julius, going to that festival, being your first one and being spoiled in this festival? Well, it was amazing. I, I spent the entire week, uh, you know, sort of willing myself to put one foot in front of the other and sort of march into rooms that I felt like I maybe didn't have any business being in and, you know, striking up conversations with beautiful, hilarious people that I was like, there's no reason why you should want to talk to me. Um, but doing it anyway and... Um, and being received really warmly and, and having it feel very much like a community and seeing the, the seriousness with which um, everybody there took it. And so it was really cool to have our project be not only just invited to come participate out of thousands of submissions, I'm sure, but to have it walk away with a, with a top prize. So like, I feel like Everything else is going to pale in comparison, you know, <laughs> but um, but I had a wonderful time. I'm glad it was the first thing. And uh, now now I know what to expect and I know how to how to go out and uh, and do the thing. So I just want to take a step back really quick. So, Julius, you obviously you've been on sets and you've been on stage before, but now you're getting on set as the lead actor in this series and it's going to be filmed a little different because it's going to go vertically instead of horizontally. So what, what is it like getting on there? How are you feeling getting on there? Were there a little bit of nerve setting and knowing you are the lead in this? Or did you feel pretty comfortable right away because of the way it was shot and stuff like that? Well, um, Dimitri did a great job of making me feel comfortable. And I was always able to just be like, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here or what I'm supposed to be doing. And he was always willing to be like, well, this is what's happening. This is the world. And this is how this is going to look. And so, um, you know, and, and on, tr on a traditional set or on a big, big budget set, they don't have time to do that kind of stuff for you. So if you don't know what's going on, if you don't, you just have to sort of fake it until you make it. And so I, I'm glad for, for that aspect of it. Um, film and, and theater are very different in two ways. One, Linearly, uh, in theater, you start at the beginning of a story and you take it to the end, and that's the way you will always tell that story is is linearly in the correct order, <clears throat> unless they're using some kind of fun convention. But with television and film and other things, um, you're filming most things out of out of sequence, and you know you could be filming the end of the series on day one and filming the beginning of the series on the last day, and so you sort of have to rearrange your brain and in that way to know where you are on your actor journey. So it's an interesting challenge. Um, I can't say that I love it yet, but I can tell you that I'm determined to fall in love with it and that it, and it interests me in a way that keeps me very um, uh, curious about how to best do it. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm just eager for more opportunities. Uh, you know, m my hope is that we turn this into eight seasons and I can learn everything I need to learn about being in front of a camera. I will say one interesting tidbit, uh, and you know this prob it probably will. D, you can probably speak to this. Um, it will probably mm. have th have this element in it, but most actors don't have to deal with cameras. And because of the way that we filmed this, a lot of the times I am the one holding the camera because that's what we do in life. You know, we're holding the phone as we walk down the street and talk to our followers and things of that nature. Um, so it was a, it was interesting to try to act, to try to make sure I had the shot to be listening to the director in one ear, you know, and, and trying to do all the other, add all the other elements. Um, it's a cool challenge. So that's, the way that, the, 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 just let me speak to that real quick. Like yeah, the, to, to, to his credit, it was, you know, really an untraditional way of filming. Like the fact that he had to deal with all this stuff, it's, it's not what you're supposed to have to deal with uh, as a filmmaker. So we, we didn't have a monitor system, right? The way that we, filmed a lot of the like exterior uh, shots or like the shots where he's walking is we had, so we had a souped up Samsung Gal uh, Galaxy Ultra 22 or 22 Ultra um, on a, like a little hand rig. And then next to it, we rigged another phone, I think Julius's phone that was just on Zoom. And so the way that we monitored him is like, we would be like uh, in a cafe down the street and I just had my laptop and we just 
would see like an approximation of the shot that were like the cameras were side by side um, of, of what he's doing and saying on zoom. And really that was great because one that's free. And two um, <laughs> it's, it's anyone anywhere could monitor it. You know, like the people that were financing it could like just watch it and be like, Oh, Hey, like my, this film that I funded is, is being made. I can watch it being uh, happening. Um, crew could be anywhere doing that, but it was, we just had to come up with all these innovative, really cheap ways to, to do traditional things, um, in a very untraditional way. And it was up to Julius to kind of still deliver this top scale performance with all of these limitations, because something like this, it, you know, looks differently. It's filmed differently. Um, it's told in this different, you know, Instagram uh, uh, way things that had to be perfect or like the acting had to be perfect. The sound had to be perfect. All these things that are expected. And so if those things are great, if the story's good, if the acting's great, then the, the audience would accept the rest of it as just kind of a stylistic choice. Um, but that was a lot of pressure on Julius and this man delivered. And did, at any point where you were worried, like, you know, we're shooting this untraditionally. We're shooting it vertically, which is not the way it's done. Were mm. you ever worried, like, maybe we should shoot this horizontally and fix it later? Or, or were you like, this is the idea. This is how we're doing it. And we're going to live and die by this. Yeah, I mean, so uh, did I ever think that? No. Everyone I talked to, all my filmmaker <laughs> friends were like, dude, like, we, like, I had um, read-throughs of the script with, with a group of very talented writers and filmmakers. And everyone really loved the script. And when I told them how I wanted to film it, they're like, oh, man, don't ruin it. Like, <laughs> like oh, you're so close to having something good. Don't do something stupid. Um, and I'm like, listen, this, this is, it's, you like the fact that it's a narrative told on Instagram, right? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, so then it has to be accurate to that, you know, visual language, right? Like, as, otherwise, what are we doing here? Like, I don't even know how to wrap my, my brain about, around doing it differently. Um, and they're like, no, take creative license. And so a lot of them were like, listen, why don't you just for safety, film it horizontally, film it traditionally, and then you can always crop, you know, in the edit, or you can always just make whatever creative adjustments that you want if you decide to go that route. And I'm like, first of all, it's going to be impossible to frame anything that way because you would, you would just instinctively frame it in a way that you would do it traditionally. And then when you go to the edit, it's, it's, you're going to, it's just a post nightmare what you're describing. Yeah. Um, but or you're going to have so much dead space on the sides. If you actually did go, or exactly. if you actually went traditionally, there should be so much dead space on each side because you were figuring you're going to cut it in the middle eventually. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, it's like, why, why, if you're going to do that, if you're planning on it, it's, why do the headache? What really, what they were trying to do is they were betting on the fact that I was going to change my mind at some point and they didn't want me to be stuck with what I got and ruin, you know, the, whatever I was planning on doing. And I, and it's one of those things where it's like, you, you respect their, their opinion and you understand why they're giving it and realize that they don't live inside your head. And so I knew that this was going to work. And so I, I knew that there's also a huge emotional resonance to the story and the character. And so the rest of it, I, I could see in my head how it was going to work out. Plus I was the editor. So, you know, it's like, I already knew what I was going to do. Um, and so it was just a lot of just trust me, just trust me. And then I, for anyone that was willing to listen to, to me talk and I talk a lot, um, I'm happy to like, I was always happy to explain how it was going to go, but there was some debates even on the last days. Cause we had, um, some reshoots and, and there was a lot of pressure to get it you know, right the second time around. And there was a lot of like conversation about, Hey, I don't agree with this. And I'm like, I, I get that. I just, just. And I'll own it if, if you don't, if you feel the same way when you see the result, but it's going to work. Yeah. And as someone that was able to get a screener and see the result of it at, and in its full, I'm telling you right now, like at first when I saw it, I'm like, oh, this is different. Like, let's see how it goes. I like when people go something that's not traditional. I like when somebody goes in a different direction to see like how artistic you can get with different ways instead of just doing the same thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And the 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 vertical of the film itself does not take away from the emotion doesn't take away from the acting doesn't really take away from anything it actually brings you in more because 
you see and and you see on there it's an Instagram thing, right? So like you see like this is all happening in front of the crowd that's supposed to be watching it, like in their mm -hmm. world. Like everything that's happening is happening in real time on mm -hmm. this Instagram feed. And it just it kind of brings you even more because it, it gives you that double like not only the drama that's actually going on on the screen, but the reality of them of the people that are sitting there watching this like they're seeing this in real time. And mm -hmm. then you think about like if you're on Instagram, just imagine going through a story or going through a reel or something like that and seeing something in real time. So I really enjoyed that different artistic way of doing it and different way of filming it. And I actually think it brought more to the, the show or film than it could have had if it was traditional. I think if it was traditional, it would look like any other story like that, you know, because there's a lot of stories yeah. that don't follow this specifically, but it'll, it would look like all the rest of them that do something like that. It just brings it in a different direction and makes it feel in a different way and makes it more about like what we have today. I mean, nobody even watches, nobody gets the news on TV. Nobody gets uh, their updates on TV. They get it all on their phone. So it's really bringing into that new age way of thinking. So it's a whole, I really it's a enjoyed whole that. World. That was really done. Yeah. We are Thanks, watching, man. Yeah, thank you. we watch um, all of our news broadcasts from television filmed and put onto Instagram. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like mm -hmm. clips from that. Yeah. But the, the really wonderful thing, I, I love that you said that, the really wonderful thing about taking the show to the film festival was receiving that response afterwards. So many different filmmakers walked up and they were like, when I heard that it was in this aspect ratio, I was really nervous, but you, what you did was really wonderful. I completely forgot that I was watching, you know, with the, um, the way that you 100%. filmed it. Yeah, it's like it, 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 what he did and how he intentionally um, put this thing together uh, it works the way that it's supposed to so I'm glad that he didn't listen to the naysayers because you know if this <laughs> if this project all good people would it, huh all good people all good people <laughs> just, yeah yeah, yeah. Just, but, but, yeah, but the, the vision was given to you and not to them and the way that they would have yeah. put it together would have produced something completely different and you were a good steward over the thing that was given to you from wherever I know you say you're spiritual uh, you know I, I think my I'm I, like closeted spiritual yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, were, you were a good steward over the the thing that was given to you to create it the way that it was supposed to be created and and look at what it's wrought you know just by being a good steward over it so yeah. Yeah. Well, I, when I first turned it on and I saw it was in the nine by 16, my first thought was like, oh, this is different. Like, I wonder that how this is going to hit. I wonder if it's going to take me out of it, having the dead space, having, the, and it doesn't, it doesn't at all. It keeps you just like you would watch anything else. And it shouldn't, it's funny people go in with that, right? Because that's how we watch everything now. Like it's, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Like your brain would even think like that because that's how we watch all reels, TikToks, YouTube shorts. They're all nine by 16. So why would this be any different? It doesn't take you out at all. And like I said, the emotion and Julius, your acting in that just really brings you in. And it's, it's just really well done in that way. And, and you don't fall out at all. And I think it's just a really cool way to bring TV forward and bring it into a different direction than you see every single day. And I, I think you did a really good job of that. Thank you. I think, you know, it's funny because I, people, when something becomes popular or, or, or like the new standard, people do tend to treat it like it's always been that way. And it's always been the case. Uh, but you know, it, it wasn't like widescreen only came about in like the what, late nineties. Mm -hmm. And so before that it was what, four, three, like it was four, three. It, it, yeah. It was all tube. It, yeah, so like aspect ratios change all the time. And now if you look at it, um, like even like with films like Maestro, they, like I think they changed aspect ratios like three times throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. Like it's people are playing with it in the in, in, playing the, with the form. And, and, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes like a, this uh, vertical aspect ratio becomes quite normal. But I mean, I think like one thing I don't want to have the your audience think is that like, all right, so this is like a a film with a gimmick that's like film like in this aspect ratio and then that's like the only thing that, that's interesting about it and, and that was the only thing that's challenging about it. I think like for me going into this narrative I, I was pretty sure quite off the bat that that was going to be fine. The thing for me that I was really worried about is I'm making a half hour comedy with a mass shooting in the middle of it. You know what I mean? And like pulling that off that was for me the biggest challenge. I, I think Julius has a picture of me preparing, like reading through the script, like half an hour before we, we started, like waiting outside the grocery store, like in my car, just like flipping through the thing, like making notes, like frantically, like I was, that was the most anxious I've ever been in my life. Um, because 
it had to it had to hit the right tone where it didn't feel fake or forced or sensationalized. It had to feel super real, but it also had to be not overly traumatic for the audience because at the end of the day, it's also a comedy. Um, mm -hmm. And so just the, the, that to me was the biggest challenge of this was, was somehow need, uh, uh, threading that needle. Yeah. And, and to go back up what you were saying, when I first turned it on, that I'm not gonna lie, that's what I thought. I was like, oh, this is in 4.3, that's gonna be the thing about this. But then when, you, when you're watching it, you forget it's in 4.3. So even if you were to say like, oh, that's the gimmick, it's really not because you don't even remember that it's in 4.3. Like you're just watching it and you're just engaged in it because of all the different aspects of it. You're, like you're talking about the mass shooting, like I said, the acting, the drama, the comedy, all the stuff that's brought into it. Just, mm -hmm. you don't even remember that it's in 4.3 right as it goes along which so i you saying i don't want people to think it's a gimmick even when you first go in thinking that trust me it, you're going to fall right out of it immediately because it doesn't feel like it when you're actually watching this 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 film this tv show it, it you yeah. feels like you're watching a tv show it feels like you're watching something that you'd watch on tv because that's how it's written that's how it's done and that's how you get brought in with the writing and the acting so yeah i just wanted to say like you say I don't want you to think it's a gimmick. Even when I went in at first and saw it was four three, I was like, "Oh, this is going to be like a traditional thing, but it's just going to be shot differently." And it doesn't feel like that at all. It doesn't feel like well, that. I'll, at all. I'll say, so it wasn't four three. It was so traditional is, is uh, a sixteen by nine, right? Sixteen so, by nine. Six, that's what so, I mean. Like you think it's going to go in sixteen by, 16. by yeah nine by I, sixteen is the way yeah. it, this one is. Yeah. And it, yeah, so it doesn't feel different at all. Backing up and speaking awesome. to our to our mass shooting thing for anyone that might be triggered, I want you to understand that it is a comedy <laughs> and that we do foil the mass shooting before it happens. So don't don't yeah. worry for anybody who is who is nervous about a thing like that. That's one of the the ways that um, so Billy Brown is is a, a former. I don't know if we've talked about this. He's a, a former. Yeah, 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 set it up. yeah. <laughs> we've got the synopsis the plot, of the whole thing. I think right? Chris would do it in the intro. I, I would. It's done in the intro, but we haven't gotcha. done it in this part of it at all. Yeah. Cool. So it's a. Uh, I play a former '90s child star who is desperately trying to hold on to fame and grasp onto any fame that he has by. Um, Putting his entire life on, on yes. social media. Yes, and um, you guys do a good damned, job afterwards uh, you know, of relationships be playing up the comedy he's, he's from like that situation on, based on, on hanging the on fame, different accounts and stuff and like that of it. So it does a really good job of all that. I definitely again agree by with that. So, doing a mass shooting in a, in a grocery store and uh, hilarity ensues. So nobody needs to worry about uh, the, the mass shooting being triggering because it is, you know, we, we stop it before it gets there. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you guys do a good job afterwards of playing up the comedy from that situation based on the different accounts and stuff like that of it. So it does a really good job of all that. I definitely agree with that. So Margaret Tro had an appearance in this film. How did you get somebody like that to join your film? I mean, it was literally like a miracle. Uh, so I knew that I wanted someone with like some real gravitas uh, to to play um, a character that uh, sort of a, a, a Katie Couric role, like a um, uh, an anchor who comes in and gives um, Billy Brown his like big opportunity he's been waiting for. And I've been a huge fan of, of Margaret Cho for a really long time, um, and she's you know Bay Area legend. Um, and so again through through the kindness of Michael Pritchard and the late great um, Richard Friedman, who was the editor of the Vallejo Herald. Um, who reached out to Paula Poundstone and like all these people sort of connected to get me um, to, and, 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 and Margaret communicating. And so it just happened to turn out, another one of these like amazing coincidences, that Margaret was on a tour and was like, just like three or four days after the conversation, was doing a, a, a one show, one night only, at the Grattan Casino about you know, 40 minutes away from me. And so um, she, she read the script and liked it. And she's like, all right, yeah, that's fine. I can do that. Um, I can give you a half an hour before my show. And so I'm like, okay. So I, I called around, everybody was busy. So I had no, like, no help, no, like, no one can like, help unload it. No one can help film it. So I, it was me and my Prius and like, packed it to the brim with all of my equipment, all my sound, all my like, C stands, everything. Uh, I show up in this frenzy, I get the casino to give me a dolly, and I show up in her dressing room, and uh, she's like, all right, so here's the dressing room, like, set up over here, you gotta be, like, out in a half an hour. 
And so I'm like, oh my God. Okay, so I set up, I, I take over, I destroy her dressing room. I, I put up background, five lights, get the camera all set up, everything. Um, I give her wardrobe. <laughs> like uh, I'm doing like 10 things at once. I am able to set up, film her, strike everything, and take everything out all in 25 minutes in this mad dash. Um, she was lovely, you know, had everything memorized, um, gave me a bunch of takes, uh, just really, really sweet and, and has ever since been this really great voice of encouragement and, and validation. Um, so it's, it's, it was really, really kind that she participated in it um, and, and has been, you know, a, a, a very a kind voice when, when I needed it. Having done films in my own background, I know that kind of frenzy. Did you have experience with that kind of by yourself, quick time turnaround frenzy that kind of helped you in that moment? Or was this a first time experience for you doing like quick 30 minutes, get it set up, get it broken down. You're by yourself. Go, man. That's, that's the guerrilla filmmaking at its finest. When in those moments, like that is when you think more clearly and focused than you ever have in your life. Everything that's waste is just falls, uh, falls to the side and you just become so clear about what you have to do and you just go into a fugue state. Um, it's happened before, actually during the grocery store scene, we had um, one of the actors um, who was very vital to the scene uh, fall out just like an hour or two before we were supposed to film this thing and we only had one chance at it. And so, I was just sitting in my car going through my mental Rolodex of people that I know that could be available and good because they had to also keep up with Julius in the scene and had comedy chops. Um, the, the guy who played the store, the, the store employee. Um, I mean, like, that's not a huge role, but it's important to the story. It's important to the narrative. He has two scenes and, you know, has to hit some comedy uh, beats. Um, like, he really brought the comedy in that scene. And so I, in that moment, just lucked out and knew another filmmaker who um, had been a long, long term partner for one of the actresses in the um, Anyone's Guest sequence, um, who was just around and had an amazing theater background as well and came in, great energy, kept up with Julius, like was a huge help. And just in one of those moments where like everything is clear hyper hyper focus it's it's terrifying and and such a high when that happens it doesn't happen often but when it does it's amazing i would definitely say so i mean uh out of all of the supporting characters i would say that character had the most comedy marks to hit and it was only mm -hmm. it was only two or three but they were really drove in an important part of the story where you have to hit in the comedy or it could go really wrong mm -hmm. that person had to hit that so i understand what you're talking about that That's he had an hour to prepare like I also had to fit him for wardrobes. So I had to he had to fit like the the role, the like the look of the character, and fit literally the wardrobe that I had. I didn't have any time to get a new one. So yeah, it's filmed. It's at the festival. You win an award for it. What's happening next? That you could say obviously. What's happening next? Where are you trying to bring this next? Who are you trying to get in the hands of? Yeah, I'm. Mean, so it's it's. We I mean we see a huge future for it. Um, uh, it's, it's funny because it's like, it's been a whirlwind. Like we, we were racing to the finish line to get it even submitted to Series Fest. I made it like to, I think it's like the last day of the last deadline. Um, and so because I submitted it so late, um, it got in right away. Um, and so, and then we went and screened it. Like it was like, I think less than a month after we found out we got in and then we all of a sudden won. So like, Hey, great first, you know, for great start. Um, one for but one. It was, it's so early that we haven't actually even heard back from anyone else. So we have no idea, like in terms of festivals, what festivals it'll even play in. We, we should hear back soon, hopefully. So, you know, fingers crossed. And we'll definitely um, keep an uh, audience updated on that. We'll reshare it all and make sure you guys can see it. So you can go, everyone that's listening can go see it when it's showing near them as well, because I definitely yeah. recommend going to see it. But we have, we, what we, we want to do is we want to bring this to Instagram. Um, we want to hopefully partner with them to bring this out to the masses because not only is Instagram, you know, the narrative, the way, the, the way in which that we tell this narrative, but it also is Julius and, and my backstory. You know, like I connected with Julius on Instagram. I connected with 
um, a lot of the people in the cast and crew. Because sometimes, like, when you don't know, like, when you have something that you have to figure out for this production or post-production and I don't have the ability to do it, well, we live in such a connected world that there are times when I literally just messaged someone uh, on Instagram. They're like, hey, can you, like, help me out with this, like, CG part? And then they just did that um, and then sent me the files. So Instagram is just so woven into the fabric of this project that I just, I feel like it's a natural, natural, um, fit. And so hopefully they agree. Um, but we, we see, you know, we see a traditional series, but we also see, um, supplementary stuff that we want to do exclusively for, um, Instagram. So like we have a, you know, a real in quotation marks, uh, account for Billy Brown as if it's the real person living his cringy life. Um, and so we'll be posting, you know, Julius acting as Billy, um, true to form on his real Billy Brown, um, handle. Uh, and so that like, we see it like where as the series gets made, um, each episode has supplemental Billy Brown footage that's exclusive for Instagram on that. Um, and then another idea I have also that I'd really love to do is a, uh, supplemental podcast where it's like a rewatch of his um, glory day, like sh uh, show called Anyone's Guess from when he was not his fake 90s um, sitcom, where it's a, a almost like a radio comedy where Julius or just as Billy Brown rewatches re episodes of his show that doesn't actually exist, but in this world does. So, um, you know, we would be basically writing this show as an audio comedy. It's, it's kind of like when. Uh... Bojack Horseman did the horse and around Christmas episode on Netflix where it was a full mm -hmm. episode of the show that he yes. was on in his exactly. universe that yep. came out to Netflix. Kind of you're talking in the same like he's reviewing a show from his universe that doesn't yep. exist, but now you got to write a whole new show. And then that's 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 how my brain works. That's you know, I think all at once. <laughs> and no, but Bojack Horseman is a great example because the way that I pitch this around is it's basically Bojack Horseman meets Truman Show for the Instagram generation. Yeah. That's what I felt from actually, I didn't say the Truman Show part, but I said like, this is like a Bojack Horseman if it was made on a phone today, like kind of thing. Like if it yeah. was showing his perspective of him live streaming instead of it in a traditional sitcom type way. Perfect. Yeah. Very, very, very correct. So you guys have all this social media you have that you are doing to promote this. Is there anything people should be looking out for on the social media, anything fun behind the scenes or something towards the show that could really give them excitement to watch this? Yeah, funny you should ask. Um, I, I, like I'm a big fan, a big geek of theme songs growing up. Like you could hear me all through my house singing the DuckTales, singing the Chippendales, singing a, um, not Chippendales, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, <laughs> Chippendales, oh, you're Chippendales huh? Chip, not Chippendales, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, like even the Mr. Belvedere, like all the theme songs from that time are just like so iconic and, and rest so within me. And so I got the opportunity to write an original theme song for our show within a show and uh, enlisted one of my Broadway pals who has an incredible voice to sing it and I'm pretty proud of it and so we're gonna do a drop of the original theme song with my buddy David singing it, David Huey, Broadway star, um, but we're only gonna drop it if we get to a certain number of followers on Instagram so you know we'll, dr we'll drop all the details on that soon but come follow us along. So, Dimitri, a funny story about theme songs. Um, this is completely not towards your show at all. Julius came on one of my podcasts to talk about theme songs and actually had one of the most uh, interacted with, for that podcast, one of the most interacted with clips when he said the Adventure Time theme song is the worst oh, yeah. theme song of all time. And people hated wow. that take. Yeah. <laughs> hated wow. that take. Yeah. That's a bold... Bold stance. Listen, now, I, I stand to, by my my statement, although I probably shouldn't have said it. <laughs> <laughs> to be very, fair, very you true. didn't yeah. say that you hated the show. You no. just said the theme song itself yes. was not great. But yes. people took it as you hate the show because that's the internet sometimes. But that yes. it, it was very interacted with and very not well received. By yes, the, the internet, as Finn has said many times, punched me right in my fat basket. Wow, that is a, a sentence. Uh, well, maybe all of those very passionate people will you, you'll be redeemed in their eyes when they, when they hear and see the theme song that you created for anyone's guess 
that uh, if you love like Golden Girls theme song and, and all those classic, uh, you know, Family Matters theme song, like you'll like this one. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. We really appreciate you being here. All the links for anything that you can see the previews and you can find these guys are going to be down below. Thank you guys for being here. We really appreciate that. Thank you for having us. Good to see you, my friend. Good to oh, see man. you too. It's been a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Julius, for coming back on. Thank you, Dimitri, for coming on for the first time and you know, meeting you for the first time. You were a pleasure to have on. Remember to follow Schnabel Studios and Mad Props at Mad Props Pod on Instagram, Facebook, and X slash Twitter, or Schnabel Studios on Facebook, Instagram, X slash Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and TikTok to stay most up to date with us. Follow Good Guy with the Pun. Everything's going to be down in the description. So if you're looking for something, check out the description. We'll have everything. We'll have preview to the, we'll have the preview to the, 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 the show. We'll have their social medias, all that stuff you can find in the description of this. So go down there and check that out. Thank you guys all for listening. We will be back again next week. It'll be a solo podcast, but I'm very excited for it. It's going to be another baseball one. So I hope you guys like baseball, but it's going to be a fun podcast to do. I know those are really exciting for a lot of the people in our fan base. So we'll be doing that next week. I'm not going to hang on too long. I just want to say thank you all again for coming on and listening we're nothing without our audience, and we really appreciate you being here listening and taking some time to listen and talk mad props. So leave us a comment. If you like this, give us five stars if you like this. Make sure you like and subscribe on anywhere you get your social media or on YouTube if you are on there so we can keep building and growing. We will see you next week. Thank you for joining Mad Props. See you later.